it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, you may wonder what is an art college doing talking to you, but we are the Royal College of Art. We're 80% about design. Um, the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design has been going for 25 years and exists solely for one purpose and one purpose alone. That is to use design to improve people's lives. And I think this is where conversations with Nick and the consortium started. It's a fantastic consortium to be a part of, and I'm not just saying that because Nick is in the room. Um, we, we are a multi-skilled bunch of people. There's an insurance company there, there's an energy company, there's the um, technologists, and all of these people felt that we couldn't just inflict a new technology on people without actually understanding their needs, their wants, and their aspiration. So enter stage left, the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, and the Royal College of Art. This is myself and Professor Dale Harrow, um, who uh, we're co-leading uh, the project together. And for many of us, this is the first driverless vehicle, the flying carpet. And I think there's something here that captures a zeitgeist, a kind of imagination of us when we think of driverless vehicles today. You know, I love Nick's slide of um, the older lady, um, you know, um, who um, uh, got used to the driverless vehicle and felt that it want, she wanted it to go a bit faster. I kind of uh, relate to that myself. Um, but from frying carpets, you know, um, to the consortium, um, we really asked um, a couple of research questions. And one was, what are people's perceptions and attitudes towards autonomous vehicles and what, and that will be important when designing for acceptance and adoption? So quite often, you know, technology manufacturers, architects, designers, engineers, we create something, then throw it at the market. What happens if you start to look at this radical step change in mobility? And you know, I love Lola's thought of it being an experience and a service rather than a vehicle. What happens when you get to that level of acceptance and adoption? What happens if you've got it wrong? So we are embedding this right, from, right in from the start. Um, and the other thing is, you know, how might the design of autonomous vehicles influence people's perceptions and attitudes to make accept acceptance and adoptions more likely. So we've um, done a sort of road map. I, I don't expect you to, see, to read this. Um, it's just to, up there to prove that we did a lot of work. Um, but it's really looking at the concerns and benefits of autonomous cars. And everything from death and accidents to costs to urban environment to infrastructure to hacking um, insurance and law, policy and control, we've looked at a lot of things. But the main thing that we've done in this tranche of the project is talk to people. We've run um, uh, uh, nearly 12 different workshops with people across London. Um, and we had a number of different participant groups, people with additional needs on the left, drivers, non-drivers, um, we had um, uh, enthusiasts, and you know we've also we've also um, uh, had professional uh, people as well, professional stakeholders. Um, the interesting thing for us is our methodology isn't just to go for an average type of user. You know, none of us would um, introduce ourselves, kind of say, "Hi, I'm Rama. I'm average." You know, the average doesn't really exist. So we've been looking at sort of extremes, because I think that informs the edges and sort of fills in the middle. So, you know, taking people with additional needs, we've talked to people who are much older, who may have lost a driving license. Um, we've talked to younger people and kids. We've talked to visually impaired people um, and people with um, um, a, a reduced level of hearing as well. And these people tell us something interesting about mobility. Um, in the first activity, we really mapped hopes and fear, fears. You know, you can tell this is a workshop. It's got the prerequisite number of post-it notes on the wall. So you can tell we're really working. Um, and we also got people to co-develop ideas. We didn't just want to use people as guinea pigs and say, you know, let's study you. Let's kind of um, bounce you around in a vehicle and see what happens. We wanted people to have a platform for expression. 
And these are just some of the things that we, you know, we got people drawing, imagining, and um, talking about what they would, they would potentially do in a driverless vehicle. Because, you know, we do more than just drive in a car or be driven. We eat, we talk, we flirt. Sometimes flirting can lead to something else. We do many, many different things in a vehicle. And sometimes the vehicle um, can be the only space where you are truly by yourself, that you can listen to music, um, even in your own house, you know. Um, the equivalent that a lot of people talked about the vehicle being, the equivalent room was the bathroom, where you can be truly alone. So there is something of that sense of privacy and ownership of space, that as you move into these kind of public and shared hybrid mo modalities that are quite interesting. And we also got people to map journeys. What, would, what are they doing? What would they be doing? What could they be doing? Could you be um, sleeping, for instance? Um, you know, if Hilton did a driverless vehicle, could you go to sleep in Glasgow and wake up in Paris? Um, for instance, so starting to think about these things, we really got people's imaginations fired. Um, and again, you know, just sort of getting a sort of dream experience check checklist. Important to get people to dream in this, not just to answer questions. Both are important. And then we also entered into vehicle design and we got people to design vehicles. And um, right in the bottom center there, you can see the fantastic material that we used, Lego. Um, everyone understands Lego, everyone plays with Lego, and people really enjoyed this. It, they, we, you know, giving people permission to be a kid again and dream and imagine was really important. This may seem like a child, childish activity, but actually what came out of it was very serious. Because what people described using their Lego vehicles was a real set of needs and aspirations. And of course you got the kind of crazier ideas like a kebab shop or you know a park bench that floats around. But we actually turned those into ideas because when you ask people, why should it be a kebab? Well, they would say, well, um, non-drivers, non-users should benefit from it. You know, Lola talked about 80% of the city space. I think cars are parked up pretty much 90% of their time. Um, what we took from that is people's aspiration that this should give back to the city. If the design of the roads started to encroach on pavements and zebra crossings and control crossings, that's our way of understanding where we are. And if that is encroached on, then I would not be able to go out with my guide dog. She would not be able to work. And for me, that would be... Um, a lifeline lost. She is priceless to me because she gives me freedom and confidence and independence. So I put this up. This is a lady who has low vision talking about if you remove some of the road infrastructure and one of the beautiful things about driverless vehicles is you may not need the visual clutter that we have in the city. They could navigate um, either using a fixed track or using cameras or just recognize what's in the, in the environment. But for some people with low vision, that would mean a loss of quality of life. And I think this really talks to the fact that we are constantly negotiating different needs and aspirations in this space. You know, Nick is a very brave man for stepping into this because we're, you're constantly having to juggle different tensions and different needs. Um, this is the vehicle. Nick has introduced it, and I'm sure Graham will, will talk even more about it. But it's a great sort of platform for design, invention, and intervention. Um, and, you know, we've gone out and done some tests in the last uh, couple of weeks um, on the vehicle. It's called Henry, by the way. Um, so Henry has um, um, had a few people rolling around, and you can see some of our researchers on the bottom left um, going through some very sort of imaginative, descriptive things um, on the vehicle. We've also commissioned bits of research in California where um, driverless vehicles are sort of pootling around. You know, I'm sure you've read uh, about this in the news, Tesla, Google, etc. And um, the reason we're doing all of this is we're uncovering really surprising things. So one of the things is in California, guess which group really likes driverless vehicles? Any guesses? Petrol heads, boy and girl racers. Why? Because if you're herring down a road and there's a human driver in front of you, 
You don't know what they're going to do. A driverless car will always behave and move out the way to let you go past. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, you know, in California is that car culture. And that was a really sort of interesting thing. It's a little bit of a, a more frivolous one, but I just share it with you as one of the surprising things. Um, these are just some of the, um, we, we put a GoPro camera to, uh, uh, in the roof to just kind of observe what people are doing and um, sort of through food, popcorn, various other different things um, at them. We are going to get a little bit crazier in what we do. So I wanted to end um, with some design work. Um, we are designers. Um, we do work with social anthropologists, psychologists, um, and we do have a multidisciplinary team of engineers, architects, etc. But um, what we produce is design. And what we wanted to create um, for this section of the project was some imaginative futures for around driverless vehicles. Um, we created a set of design briefs um, which really deconstruct the vehicle. You know, the problem with design and driverless vehicles is the word vehicle. So if I say to you vehicle um, and you get you to draw something, it would look like a car. But, you know, <coughs> bottom right is my favorite, which is a banana on wheels. And this was just really meant to talk about what if it was food on wheels, you know, to fire the imagination of people, fire the imagination of our designers. And they came up with many, many different things. These are not meant to be real. They're meant to be inspirational, provocative, uh, and informative. And a lot of these have been designed from the real insights and the real research. So I'll just uh, take you um, through some of them. So some of these things are looking at the size of the vehicle. You know, if you don't need um, particularly to have a driver space or a boot, it could be a box, which is very space efficient, um, you know, especially in countries like Japan or Hong Kong. Um, it could be tall, so you could walk into it, which is ease of access for people of all ages, all abilities. Um, you know, that is, that is incredibly inclusive if you can walk into a vehicle. A bus is great for that, but a bus is not great for other things. Um, what if it could have um, sleeping cubicles? What if you could actually use these driverless vehicles to move around the airport to change the architecture of a building? So. If a flight is delayed, could you bring in a raft of driverless vehicles to actually sleep people instead of carting them off to an off-site off hotel? So it starts to get you thinking about different service strategies. Um, this was looking at how do driver, driverless vehicles show intention. So there's lots of adverts on the radios at the moment um, about you know, cyclists make eye contact. You know, drivers make eye contact with the cyclist. And we do that naturally. You know, if you, if a, if um, you see the, uh, if you're cycling around London, and you see that a car has stopped or is indicating, and you you know the, you see the driver and they say go ahead, you go ahead. How do you do that with a driverless vehicle without it being annoying, without it being full of noise pollution or light pollution? So we were looking at very subtle ways um, of making that happen. How how it could show intention. And um, this was actually, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, it could sense, and actually we were looking at how the front of the vehicle might move independently of the structure of the vehicle to signal intention, like a little, you know, like the nose of a dog, sort of sniffing. Um, we were looking at how you could redefine a sports car. So a sports car, instead of it being a sporty car, could it be a car you do sports in? And could you swim your way to work? And could you swimming actually power the vehicle in some way? Or cycling, so could you share with your neighbors? Um, this was looking at a much more solid, bigger vehicles. So picking up in your idea of the polycentric city, could you have bigger vehicles that move between those nodes and smaller vehicles that break off and go into the city street? The big challenge is you know, the last sort of kilometer of any journey. Um, and that remains a challenge ac across the, the world. So could you have vehicles that break up and do different things? Um, could you have um, the toilet that comes to you? Or, so like you could dial an Uber. Could you, if you need a toilet, could this come to you? But could it also deliver all the services? Could it be a bookstore? Could it be an Amazon outlet? Could it be anything? So you start to look at how might um, 
other service providers become involved with the architecture of the city. Um, this was just another definition of the sports car. Um, you know, I love the impracticality of this, um, but it's just a beautiful image. Could you surf your way to work? Or could it actually be, um, uh, you know, a, something that brings joy, mischief, and witticism into the city? Um, you know, it's, it's quite often when we're designing things, we get very serious, and we forget about things like play, like mischief, like wit. And I think with this project, it's something we want to explore. Um, this is a slower moving vehicle that um, moves um, around the city. It's a cafe. So you could start in Oxford Circus and you know, two hours later end up in Belsize Park. And what you've been doing is drinking coffee and working um, like you would in Starbucks, but you could actually be slowly, um, slowly moving. So we're also looking at speed. Could it be ultra slow? Could it be ultra fast? Um, and then this was just some more sort of playful exploration vehicles. This was um, looking at different cultures. The, you know, why does it have to be the size of a car? Why can't this thing be the size of a bicycle or a mobility scooter? And, um, you know, so this was one thing that we looked at, which um, um, we were playing on the idea of dogs. So one idea was, um, could it walk your dog for you? Could you book a driverless vehicle to come and walk your dog? Um, you know, you could even put your, uh, what do you call those things, uh, um, um, a Fitbit on it, and you can get your daily count if you wanted to. Um, or could it be a noodle bar that um, comes to you? Um, again, so thinking of the size of the vehicle, it could be this big, it could be the size of this room. Um, you know, there's a lot of freedom there. And this was, again, looking at how it, you know, parking space being an issue, could this actually go vertically? And, you know, a lot of this is imagined in sci-fi movies. So at the, um, I'm nearly finished, at the um, London Transport Museum, we had a exhibition called Driverless Futures, Utopia or Dystopia, because we wanted to address people's hopes and their fears. You know, hopes such as the visually impaired person who keeps on tweeting me, saying, I cannot wait to be a driver. Um, you know, the parents who said to us, we would love for the driverless car to pick our kids up from school, but for the car to deliberately get lost. So <laughs> it babysits them for a little longer. Right the way through to the dystopian version where, you know, um, things like the transport in industry or the taxi industry are jobs lost or are they change? Do they um, mutate? Do they evolve? Um, so that kind of human challenge, challenges. So I just want to end you, uh, leave you with this picture, which was the very final design we had for the driverless loo, speeding down the road towards you. But it could also be a single person vehicle that breaks off from that big bus and delivers you right to your door. And thinking of, um, if you think in geographic U uh, Europe, when you say dis someone with disabilities, everyone thinks wheelchair user, because that's the symbol. That's a really small amount. The biggest number is people who cannot walk without aid for long distances. And that could be most of us, you know. That was me in Tokyo trying to carry two 30 kilogram suitcases through the, um, through the uh, underground. I've never had a workout like that, I swear. I didn't want to do that again. So this is a really kind of versatile, just little pod that we imagined. And I think just lots and lots of ideas come out of that. So watch this space. Thank you very much. Over to Graham.